Well, it's Sound Month in Review time again with Joel Conley and Chuck Taylor right here on Public Exposure. I'm Stan Emmert, except instead, this being December of just a month in review, we're going to look at the whole year. So, uh, Joel, Chuck, welcome back as always. Uh, let's talk about some big stories of the year. First big story has got to be the war in Iraq. Um, I don't know that there could ever be a bigger story than uh, a war overseas where Americans are dying as well as people from other countries as well. And we're still talking about it in the present tense. Uh, yeah, in the present tense. Uh, just, uh, just before leaving the office, there was this, read a story in the New York Times Wire tomorrow that we've had again, the, first, uh, the first death since Saddam Hussein's capture, the first death of an American soldier in an ambush in Baghdad. Hmm. So is it, is it a war now, or is it a police action, or just what is it? Boy, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, it, I, I'm not sure that the Bush administration even knows what it is. Uh, there was a story in the Washington Post this morning about how they've sanitized some of the government websites to um, uh, eliminate reference to the en end of the war uh, back in May. and. Um, and uh, it, I, I think I think they're still spinning this. The, the, the capture of Saddam was certainly a good a good good, good thing for uh, uh, the, the administration's public image, but uh, I I don't know how long that afterglow is going to last. Well, and, and especially mm -hmm. since this, uh, this the area here is so I mean there's so many military installations around here. It would seem that it really is important for maybe even more here than it is in other parts of the country. We've had a disproportionately large number of the casualties, but then again, a disproportionately large number of the casualties have come since the president landed on the aircraft carrier with a large sign saying, mission accomplished. Mm -hmm. As I recall, we are now to 199 deaths mm -hmm. in, in the months since then. Well, it, it, you would have to be so difficult. I was talking with my father, a World War II veteran, and he just said, I mean, if you don't know who you're fighting, it is... I mean, it's got to be so difficult on the young uh, women and men that are over there. Let's go to a picture that, that actually kind of may say it all. It's, uh, there's a picture from uh, March 2003 of the Bathurst Volunteers. And then in the corner, there's a, in the lower picture, there's a picture of a tribal leader who was a volunteer uh, also on the side of, of Saddam who comes driving up in a car, uh, rather a, a luxury car. Uh, and it just, how do you know who you're fighting? It's um, apparently we're we're finding out more about who we're fighting, and we're beginning to uh, uh, again go in very very heavily to the areas that are perceived to be against us. But there's the wider problem of the fact that you know you had a homogeneous country in Japan that General MacArthur was able to reorganize after after World War II, but here you have the Shiites and the Sunnis who don't like each other, the Kurds in the uh, northern part of the country. Who are uh, suspicious? They've, uh, you know, been betrayed by most American administrations since World War II, <laughs> and uh, so uh, the question becomes: Are you trying to build something, uh, the foundation of something, out of sawdust? Yeah. And and, and the other th the other thing about the whole attitudes among uh, the Iraqis is that it's it's hard it's hard you can oversimplify all of these factions. And a lot of Iraqis uh, I read this morning are quite surprised that Saddam didn't fight, even though they're happy he was captured. Uh, they they're somewhat ashamed of the fact that he didn't go down fighting because that reflects on all Iraqi men. I mean, and it, mm -hmm. so the, the reactions to what's happening uh, probably are, are are going to be as complex as they would be in any any country that's under that kind of duress. And the unfortunate truths are it really reflected in the next two pictures, two graphics that we have. Uh, the first one is of a uh, uh, there's a U.S. soldier and a civilian. Well. Of course, there, there's the U.S. soldier and the civilian, and, and this has to be very difficult for the person with a gun in his hand, and then the picture in the lower right is, of course, of wounded. But then if we go to the next picture, and this, of course, was in the weekly, uh, Chuck, um, this is the absolute truth of what we're facing every day now, it seems. Yeah, the, um, the death toll of uh, service people from, with connections to Washington State is 19 now. Um, there is also another civilian. Um, our cover story this week about uh, profiling the uh, dead um, who have called Washington home or still do um, mentions 18 people who are in active uh, duty and one civilian. But uh, just as we went to press, uh, we got word of another uh, another man from the state who uh, was uh, killed uh, this week. And I 
I've said this before. I think I think that the the political challenge uh, between now and the election is is the body bag count. I mean, that's mm. the stark reality that that hits home the hardest. And um, there's still a lot of support for the war. Uh, Bush's uh, favor uh, uh, popularity ratings, you know, have taken a, a little bump. Uh, are are up again a little bit, and um, well, that's ever since the Saddam Hussein capture. And let's have let's have a picture of Saddam then and now. And uh, Joel, that's probably the bigger question. Uh, when I when I first heard of his capture and then the discussion of a trial, uh, my thoughts are: Do we really want him to talk? Well, there's a question of what what does he have to say first by way of helping the uh, helping the hunt for weapons of mass destruction where it appears increasingly likely that, we, that you may have had generals lying to him that they were still preparing these things, telling the dictator what he wanted to hear. But there's also uh, other things that he could talk about. Um, we are approaching on the 20th of December, the anniversary, the 20th anniversary of the meeting between Saddam Hussein and the emissary of the Reagan administration, one Donald Rumsfeld, in, uh, in Baghdad about uh, you know, surreptitious cooperation between the Iraqis in the United States in the in the war that was then underway against Iran, mm -hmm. um, do we want to do we want him to uh, talk about that? In fact, it is that meeting that uh, has led to the the joke about how does Don Rumsfeld know that there are weapons of mass destruction <laughs> in Iraq? Answer: He's got the receipts. Yeah. Um, and um, so anyway, uh, we want Saddam to talk about one thing, and we might get a little embarrassed if he talked about another. Some of the arrangement, financial arrangements with high French and Russian officials, however, might be, uh, might be grist for the mill. Well, uh, it'll certainly be interesting to follow, and um, I don't know. I'm, I'm one for uh, let's, uh, let's let the Iraqis try him and the chips fall where they may. We'll see what happens. Uh, something that is probably a very big story here in Washington State is the void of leadership. Uh, the void of leadership. And let's just start right at the University of Washington where uh, we have uh, Rick Neuheisel, Barbara Hedges, and then of course we have drugs because we've got a drug scandal going on right now at the University of Washington. Man, I mean, could it be any more messed up? Well, and then, you know, they're also facing uh, uh, funding problems for mm -hmm. the less glamorous areas of the school. Um, I, I mean, it's it's whoever's going to be the long-term president uh, at UW is going to have their work cut out for them, and um, the rumor, of course, is that they're getting ready to bring Gary Locke in after he s finishes his term as governor in a year. I don't know. What do you make of that? Well, Dan Evans essentially saved the Evergreen State College, not to mention the fact they repel repelled down the clock tower on one occasion. <laughs> um, and there, um, uh, there is there is president Dwight Eisenhower was even the president of Columbia University for a bit, um, so that you basically apply political skills to the funding uh, to the funding and the fundraising problems that uh, that universities face, and you know, and let the elect the faculty senate yap, which it always will. But he hasn't been great uh, for the university in his role in Olympia. Um, I wonder how effective he can be. Uh. He seems to be quite bullish on education and the budget that uh, that came out uh, just today okay. and that uh, he may be... It's a curious situation with Locke that uh, you had an almost pack rat-like accumulation of political capital uh, during his first six years in office and he finally put some of it on the line in the 77 deal and I think he may be, um, he may be a little bit more of a, of a risk taper, taker, not necessarily a gambler too sober for that during his last year in office. Well, speaking of a leadership void, let's go back to an article, Joel, that you wrote uh, in, on April the 16th, 2003. The headline of the article was, The Overhaul of, of Seattle City Council is Long Overdue. Quoting out of the article, Incumbents down at Seattle Municipal Building are visibly nervous about their public image. Well, of course, now several of them are out of a job. Mm -hmm. uh, biggest, uh, biggest upheaval since the late 1960s. I think it needed one to uh, pump some new blood and purpose into the outfit. Uh, we had the uh, had the uh, Stripper Gate scandal, which made them made uh, people 
how do I put this, look ridiculous before the city where they had previously looked simply ridiculous before, uh, before uh, the political junkies of the city. And, um, and uh, also the reemergence of, you know, once upon a time, news, Seattle newspapers, whenever they, there was an investigative void, would, uh, would go after Frank Calacurcio for something. Well, we now have <laughs> Calacurcio's son. We have the reemergence of 95-year-old former uh, governor. A whole Al new generation Al of Ro reporters Al are Al Al Frank Al Al So, so it was, it was uh, to use Yogi Berra's famous phrase, deja vu all over again. <laughs> The shakeup continued too uh, this week with the committee assignments. Um, everyone expected Jim Compton to get the city light uh, c uh, chairmanship, and Gene Godden got that, and he ended up with utilities. And um, uh, it's there's there's a lot of there's a lot of new uh, a new stuff going on there at City Hall with um, uh, uh, Lakata is going to be on uh, heading the the Police Fire and Technology Committee and. Uh, and boy, uh, you know that uh, that is, uh, you know, kind of kind of like the uh, hills above San Diego a few months ago. You know, something you know, waiting, waiting for, <laughs> waiting for a spark. Because he's been a steady crit critic of the police. His office has been a kind of a clearing house of information on the police. So I can see the first three-hour hearing uh, of the of that committee with everybody complaining against the police, the police reacting in a very very strong fashion to it. I think um, we will have many interesting developments there. Who reaches out to whom in that situation? Is it uh, the police chief who reaches out to Nick Licata, or is it the other way around? I think uh, I can't see Licata being anything other than a 1960s activist, which he has been for the last third of a century, <laughs> and so that there will be there will be I think continued cultural clashes, differences. And of course, we have people, groups in the community, as well as front groups for toxicate groups in the community that are strongly critical of the police department. And I think that they will they will be given full vent by that committee now. Well, noticeably absent in any of our discussion is Mayor Nichols, so I, he seems to be distancing himself very well from this group. Um, but at the same time, he's raising money for newly elected members of the council. Right. <laughs> and I think he's delighted at years in with uh, the fact that uh, uh, you know, they, we appear to be moving ahead in terms of the renovation of Northgate and also the biotechnology development at the south end of Lake Paul Allen. <laughs> we got to take a break with that. Just want to remind everyone that this is a Public Exposure Sound Month in Review with Joel Conley of the PI and Chuck uh, Taylor of the Seattle Weekly. And this time we're going the, the year in review. And right now we're talking about the void of leadership here in the area, but I strongly encourage you to. Go to seattlepi.com. If you don't have a, a, the printed uh, copy right in front of you, but go to seattlepi.com, read some of Joel's columns. Go to seattleweekly.com. There's an awful lot of good stuff from Chuck Taylor recently, uh, and you're going to like what you read. Then go pick up the paper and uh, patronize the advertisers. Let's see if we can get a little plug in for them. <laughs> uh, now, let's go to continue on to the leadership void. Uh, we have just a delightful picture here of uh, Joseph Oshevsky and Bernie Clark. Uh, to people who are no more in terms of their former employment at the Seattle schools and at KCTS. Well, Bernie Clark, uh, I think, was the first to fall um, uh, last spring, and uh, for years he ran KCTS uh, as as a s somewhat progressive seeming um, public television station that was very interested in technology and uh, national production. Uh, I think he kind of envisioned it becoming WGBH. Um, but uh, but uh, somebody wasn't watching the the budget very carefully, and they got into huge trouble. And uh, and he, so he he here's a leader of a of a huge Seattle institution, huge in terms of its yeah. visibility. Um, uh, who uh, it was probably long uh, long past time for him to go. Well, speaking of the budget, the Seattle schools. I mean, and Joseph Ostrowski was the budget guy before he became the superintendent. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there again, you had a, uh, you had with both of these institutions, uh, KCTS and the Seattle School Board, you know, uh, directors that were supposed to be riding herd on the institution. So what happened is, in addition to the heads rolling, you also had multiple heads rolling on the Seattle School Board, and also a very, very critical analysis of the cheerleader role that the uh, board on KCTS 
has played. Incidentally, a journalistic tip of the hat to the weekly for its work on the KCTS oh, situation <laughs> because that, um, that fortress resisted penetration it for did. a long, long time. It did. And the other the interesting thing about the boards is that uh, those two situations paralleled what's going on in the corporate world right now, too, where uh, there's, there's, a, there's a, a renewed, em uh, or if there ever was an emphasis on, on uh, board governance, um, uh, being being uh, more uh, scrutinous of the of the businesses uh, and the the stakeholders they're sharing, um, it's been this year you know, on the national level. Hmm. Well, we're going to be covering that in uh, 2004 for sure. Uh, speaking of journalism, the uh, Times went after the PI, and the PI decided to uh, to fight back, and it uh, looks like you've won so far. Uh, yes, the um, I, I think the battle so far has been that the PI has won in court and also has won in the court of what public opinion witness uh, Frank Blethen, the publisher of the Times, hiring a former gubernatorial press secretary from outside the building to, uh, to, uh, to burnish his image. This in addition to the, to the massive amount of self-celebration that occurs in the, the, uh, the pages of that newspaper. So it, it is interesting that the Hearst Corporation, which has been uh, very uh, slow to comment, uh, has nonetheless emerged as a victor so far and the Times, with many words justifying its position and its alleged financial difficulties and so on, has found it has cast itself almost into the villain's position. Hmm. Well, I guess over at the Weekly, you're kind of happy that you don't have to get, in, get involved in that, huh? Well, and I, full disclosure, I worked at the Seattle Times <laughs> for 16 years, and so I, uh, I have uh, very mixed feelings about the whole thing. But uh, I'm, I'm really happy there's going to be there are going to be two newspapers in town, at least for the foreseeable future. No, but... and, and competition makes us work better. That's right. Good. Um, there was uh, there's a huge story, of course, and and today uh, the sentencing of uh, Gary Ridgway took place. Uh, something that has uh, plagued the area for, well, two decades. Uh, and that is, of course, is the Green River killings that, that took place. And uh, what happened was some, I suspect, was it amazing police work that was able to happen this year? Well, the uh, a DNA match that ended all of this actually happened a year ago. Um, I think I think the the most interesting development this year was the fact that he, he decided to cop a plea and sit down and help them work through a lot of these cases. I mean, the, the, uh, um, the prosecutor's office uh, originally was uh, saying, you know, we're going to execute the guy, and finally they realized that if they wanted to solve more than uh, six or seven of the 48 cases, uh, they were going to have to get him to cooperate. Mm -hmm. um, and today uh, he got sentenced to life, and case closed, I think. Is this a precedent for other cases or are other mass murderers going to come in and say, you know, I, I shouldn't get, shouldn't be executed, I should get life? If they cooperate and if they provide meaningful cooperation, and in fact that has been the debate generated on the national media of what happens if somebody is a, is a suspect in two dozen murders or something like this, and you feel that you've nailed this person on two or three, you have the, the relatives of the other victims and so on, uh, not having closure, not having certainty, and do you offer uh, do you offer even a monster life in exchange for that quote service? Our our, uh, uh, our editor uh, Knut Berger uh, made I think a pretty compelling argument that this is actually a, a sign of the value of the death penalty because without it, uh, Ridgeway would never have cooperated. Hmm. Perhaps so. Now, let's go to something that is a, is a huge story here in Seattle and always, and the Seattle Weekly, and Chuck Taylor is the one that wrote it. Uh, it's about Boeing. And the big, the big question is now is that huge tax breaks have come to Boeing. Is Boeing worth the price? Well, Joel has uh, argued this week uh, in print that it, that, it, that it is worth the price. Um, I'm, I'm a little more cynical. I, yeah, bad some, news. Boeing is well, the headline of your articles. So. <laughs> that, yeah, that's somewhat of a separate issue that leading up to the resignation of CEO Phil Condit. But uh, I mean, the, the company has been struggling ever since he's been in charge. Um, and some good news finally came with with this decision to uh, build the 7E7 mm -hmm. and uh, build it in Everett, uh, thanks to a 3.2 billion dollar. Uh, tax break from uh, the state of Washington. Yeah, but upheaval at Boeing is nothing new. I mean, uh, 1971, April 16th, we actually have a, a picture of the billboard. Will the, the last person yeah, leaving Seattle turn out the lights? We survived, yeah. 
um, it, it, that the city was a different place then. I mean, Joel, I wasn't here. Joel was. Um, it, it was far more dependent on, on Boeing at the time. It was and, a company town. Remember, employment, 100,000 down to 38,682. Now we have uh, now we have a situation where we uh, we have the so-called Silicon Forest, the technology belt. We have and the joke being that now that the Soviet Union has fallen, that the three empires that are bent on world dominion, Amazon.com, Microsoft, and Starbucks are all located <laughs> in the Seattle area. So that um, and I think the number of jobs that will be coming out of the bio, biotech on Lake Union will be substantially greater. But still, a great deal of the region's identity is tied up with Boeing. We also have the fact that we still make something here that the world wants to buy. And I think finally, we needed a demonstration by our political leadership and our business leadership that they could actually coordinate to the common interest after uh, prolonged periods of feuding and impasse. I, I think you're right about that part. I, I have trouble with uh, is it worth $3.2 billion for 1,200 factory jobs, which admittedly lead to <coughs> perhaps more than 10,000 other jobs. Um, I just don't know. That just seems like an astonishing amount of money to me. I, I, you, you could almost take those 17,000 jobs and, and just give the money out to the people. Uh, it, would, it won't serve the same purpose if, if you want to keep the economy going. And the other thing is that there's not, you know, everyone seems to think that this means that we're going to continue to build airplanes here for the foreseeable future. And there's nothing that, you know, if they come up with a new airplane in 10 years, there's nothing that says we won't have to go through the same process all over again. Except that there will be uh, by that time, an, you know, an d even deeper investment in this region, uh, in this in this in this particular field, and that that, that they are uh, that they are making this indicates that I think they're going to be, they're going to be around for a bit, and I think that is um, that's on the whole a very good thing for the uh, for the region. Well, let's say that Starbucks says, uh, you know, uh, we're going to move to Wichita, and take all of our <laughs> jobs to Wichita. I mean, uh, isn't there precedent for? you know, getting a huge tax break to stay? Um, at the same time, I think, I think that with many of the newer businesses that have come here, mm -hmm. they have come here by choice because it's a very good place to live mm -hmm. because a uh, certain extent of the natural environment. I think the environment is an economic asset here. Mm -hmm. I think the, um, the uh, a third point would be that we, uh, we have access to uh, major markets. We've always thought of our country as being connected to Europe, but now we are connected to Asia. So there are some definite natural advantages uh, advantages to uh, to being here. Um, is the fact that the leadership of Boeing at the very top doesn't seem to have a tie to the Northwest anymore? Is that something that we should fear? I I don't think so. Um, there was all kinds of uh, speculation about what Boeing should do. Um, you know, a, a, in the wake of uh, Condit's resignation after the defense uh, contract scandal, um, and 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 one person uh, suggested that it might be good for Boeing to just split again and spin off the airplane business and let it let it keep going because right now, I, uh, somewhat ironically, that's the business that's doing the best right now uh, of their three... The airplane's doing better than defense? Yeah. Um, oh, the, the defense is doing badly because of the insider stuff, right? Yeah, and uh, this, and the space uh, the space business uh, never materialized the mm -hmm. way they thought it would. And, um, and, the, and the other thing is even if they don't split the company, the guy who's now most likely to become CEO down the road is Alan Mulally, who's the... the uh, president of uh, Boeing Commercial Airplanes. And with the exception of one famous remark to the Rotary about uh, our economy, <laughs> which we cannot use on the air, right. he nonetheless, I think, uh, proved to be a very skilled uh, politician and yeah. corporate politician. He, he knows how to work the process of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to ask a question. The uh, Boeing has announced that they're, they have the ability now to transport its equipment, its the, the, the parts, th via airplane, and it doesn't need to use you know, ships that travel on the ocean anymore. And so the question that we have is, can the Port of Seattle survive without Boeing needing to uh, transport its ships in? I think, I think this, uh, um, you know, Boeing made a lot of this in, 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 when they were trying to decide on where to build the 77, that they were, they were going to fly in a lot of the parts. And mm -hmm. I, I think that was, uh, I think it was somewhat of a ploy to downplay the need to be at a big seaport. Um, I think ultimately, you know, it's cheaper by sea. Uh, if you if you don't need the part to be here in in two days, then 
you know, and you can plan ahead enough. Uh, I, I just, I think, I think that um, I'd be surprised if they really, truly started moving in a lot of their parts by pulling. Hmm. Well, I think there's the potential of the conversion of the old oil tank farm at Mukilteo, right below, basically below the plant, into a place to uh, to bring uh, to bring in those. Parts, and that's that's part of the inducement deal that got them here. Right. Well, okay. Of course, then they won't be coming into the port of Seattle. They'll be just going straight there, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, but uh, but, uh, but your your points well taken in that um, air air cargo in general is is mm -hmm. is huge now, and uh, but but it's mostly still limited to products that you know perishables, um, uh, some electronics that that um, need to move quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and the rumble over the future of the Port of Seattle with two reformist commissioners on it now is going to be a story for 2004. Right. In fact, that, that comes up. I'm going to pull a fast one on you. I'm going to say, what are the big stories of 2004 besides, of course, the election? Ah, I got you stumped. Besides <laughs> the election. <laughs> Joel, you're going to be uh, traveling and, and reporting on uh, the presidential election far before it hits Washington State, huh? A little bit before. Our caucuses are the 7th of February. We are a major outpost of the campaign supporters known informally as Deniacs. <laughs> but at the, same, at the same time, even as we speak tonight, uh, General Clark is speaking by phone to his supporters in Seattle. So there is the prospect of, prospect of a late-blooming challenge uh, that would make caucuses interesting. Mm -hmm. What's the big story in the Seattle Weekly this year? Uh, the coming year is going to be uh, probably transportation and education. Um, plus a few other things I will not reveal okay. to, my, to our and competition. And keeping track of whether the uh, the strangers editors vote in various elections. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll look we'll check in on that again next year. Well, so uh, so you both are going to, or you, the weekly for sure is going to keep a track on the Port of Seattle, and we here on the show will bring it up constantly. And you should go to the PI to do uh, to do a better job, and the Times to do a better job on this, because again, it's going right. to, it's going to be interesting, and if. One can argue the single worst and silliest expenditure of public dollars of the year has been the Port of Seattle training surveillance cameras on, on uh, distant fisherman Pete Knudsen <laughs> up at Fisherman's <laughs> Terminal. <laughs> with that, we've, we've got to close out 2003. Thank you very much for being with us this year. We'll look forward to 2004. That's been Sound Month in Review, Sound Year in Review, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing you right here on Public Exposure in 2004. See you then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs>